Have you heard of the Restoration era It Girl, who grew up in the French court but ran away from her husband to live a life of debauchery, including having an affair with King Charles II and his daughter? <gasps> How scandalous! Well, get ready for an enjoyable romp through some queer history with a bisexual icon or... Bicon? Yeah. Hortense Mancini, who broke pretty much all of the rules for how women were expected to behave in the 17th century. This video is part of my historical profile series where I introduce you to fabulous people from history who you might not have heard about, or if you have heard about them, you might not have learnt the fabulously queer or disabled truth at the heart of their story. Or both, there's a lot of us. Not that I'm a historical figure, I'm just allergic to modern clothes. In previous videos, we've talked about gender-fluid fashion royalty, King Christina of Sweden, and bisexual anti-fascist actress Marlene Dietrich. So, if that sounds like your kind of thing, you should hit the subscribe button and then check out the link to the full playlist in the description below. But today, we're going to be talking about Hortense Mancini, the Duchess of Mazarin. Hortense was one of the first women to publish an autobiographical account of her life under her own name. Her memoirs were published in 1675, and they were very much the 17th century equivalent of a big celebrity memoir coming out today. It's like spare, but with more lesbianism and sword lights. Hortense's book was filled with gossip and scandal, giving people exactly what they wanted and expected from her. Her life was full of adventures, with gazettes reporting, often somewhat salaciously, on her life and love affairs. Okay, maybe that's more Britney Spears meets Lady Whistledown's gossip sheet from Bridgerton. Now, of course, as ever, when we're talking about historical figures, it's important to know that Hortense never used the word bisexual to describe herself, as the term bisexuality didn't actually appear until 1859, when anatomist Robert Bentley Todd used it to describe people who had both male and female physical sexual characteristics, who we might call intersex today. Fun fact. However, in Hortense's case, we do have records of her affairs with both men and women, because, you know, she wrote a book about it. So it it feels fair to say that if she'd had the vocabulary of queerness we have today, she likely wouldn't have called herself straight. Childhood in the French court. Born in Rome in June 1646 to Italian aristocrat Lorenzo Mancini and Girolamo. Girolamo. Pronunciation not great for me. Really trying to work on that phonetic pronunciation thing. Trying to teach my toddler phonics. Um, it's fun. He teaches me. Oh, if anyone has any, like, deaf parents attempt to teach children phonics hacks, would love to know. And her mother, Girolamo Mazzarini. Fine. Hortense was one of eight siblings. Oh, and she was also called Hortensia, because that's the Italian version, which is actually a really cute name. Just a warning, there are going to be some really confusing names in this video. Um, I'm going to really try my hardest. I mean, you can see why the Bridgertons named their children in alphabetical order. It would have made all of the Mancini sisters' affairs and marriages so much more easier to keep track of. After her father's death in 1650, her mother brought the daughter to Paris in the hopes that her brother could help with ensuring they secured good marriages. Her brother, Hortense's uncle, was none other than the powerful and wealthy Cardinal Mazarin, who had been the Prime Minister of France in 1642 and became the Chief Minister and Tutor to Louis XIV after the death of Louis XIII. This means that Hortense and her sisters grew up in the court of King Louis XIV, along with their cousins, the Mazzolinis. And while the beauty standards of the French court at the time favoured pale skin and full of figures, the family were instead willowy with darker olive skin. They caused quite a stir, and Hortense in particular is described as being very beautiful. Of course, in the portraits we have of Hortense, the skin is very pale. Whitewashing history? It's very literal. Interestingly, though, you might notice a naked breast in some of Hortense's portraits. Now, this isn't a nip slip, although how would you ever have something like that accidentally happen in a portrait that takes many, many hours to paint is, is quite questionable. But because art in early centuries was coded and had clear symbolic meanings, very obvious to those viewing at the time, maybe not so much to us now. For one thing, in the 17th and 18th centuries, nipples, and to a point nudity in general, weren't as sexually laden as they are today, particularly from an upper class to lower class perspective. By the time an aristocratic lady reached her old age, how many different maids would have seen her undressed, helped her to put her clothes on, and helped to choose the lavatory whilst wearing a ridiculously oversized gown? Many. Secondly, other than 
accidental showage being an everyday occurrence for queens and courtiers when the fashion for gowns became incredibly low cut, the breast in the painting is a symbol for more than just a breast. The symbolism here is that she is fertile, she is bountiful, she is prosperous. Again, absolutely a superiority marker, just like having the privilege of watching Louis XIV use the toilet. Your bare-chested nudity could also be used in portraiture to communicate a lady's maternal nature towards her humble servants. You are a mother. They're like, actually don't touch me, peasant. Proposals and marriage. Hortense was very pretty and charming, and like her sisters, was ingrained in the upper echelons of the French nobility, so it's not surprising that she had a number of suitors. One young nobleman was exiled in France, fell in love with her, and proposed several times, but the cardinal didn't think much of his prospects. No money, no title, good name though. What was his name? Prince Charles. Not that one. Yes, that one. The one whose father was beheaded in the English Civil War. Yeah. So he'd run to France with his French mother and siblings, but it all turned out well for him when the restoration happened and he became King Charles. Not that one. Yeah. So, I mean, yeah, I know that name was definitely a choice. Anyway, so that happened just a few months after the Cardinal had turned down his last proposal on Hortense's behalf. Because obviously a woman shouldn't have any say in who she marries. Once Charles was reinstated as king, the cardinal went back to him, of course, saying that Hortense has changed her mind. She'd actually love to marry him. Perhaps unsurprisingly, Charles was no longer interested. Oh, but don't worry, he comes up again later in Hortense's adventures. Hortense received a number of other promising proposals, including from Charles Emmanuel II, the Duke of Savoy, and another Charles, the Duke of Lorraine. What is it with that name? However, in both cases, arrangements fell through when the Cardinal refused to include the castle of Pyrrhonon, Hortense's dowry. Obviously, for aristocratic families, marriages at this point in history were not about love or romance, but about politics, money and power. Well, I mean, money and power control politics. Money doesn't actually insulate you from power, so power, it's just power. The Cardinal had no children of his own, as he was a high-ranking Roman Catholic clergyman. So he saw his nieces as a way he could secure his power and legacy. Hortense's sisters and cousins thus had to be married off to dukes and princes. First sister, Laura, the oldest, married one of the king's cousins and became the mother of a very famous general. Then there was Olympia. She married Prince Eugene Maurice of Savoy Cariagno and became the mother of a very famous general. Then there was Marie. Now she was Louis XIV's first romantic love, but despite his objections, she was not considered an appropriate match, so not a princess. So he had to marry the Spanish Infanta Maria Theresa in what both the Cardinal and Queen Regent considered a more politically important alliance, which was kind of fair. But she did get to marry the Italian nobleman, Prince Lorenzo Alforio Colonna, so that's nice. And then there was little Marie Anne who married the Duke of Boulogne, so and then Hortense. She was said to be the Cardinal's favourite niece, but it wasn't even until his deathbed in 1660 that he secured a marriage contract for her. Armand Charles de la Porte de Milleray was one of the richest men in Europe, but oh, he was more than twice Hortense's age when they were betrothed. Yay. Hortense was just 15 when the Cardinal died, leaving not only a fortune, but his name to the couple, and leaving Hortense, in her own words, the richest heiress and the unhappiest woman in Christendom. Armand was very pious, in a way that Hortense, with a delight for teenage romance and practical jokes, was not. He had some, shall we say, distinctly odd ideas. For instance, he believed that spending too much time with cows would make milkmaids attracted to them. I think that tells us more about you than anyone else, Armand. He also had the teeth of female servants removed to stop them from attracting attention from men, and then utterly destroyed all of the valuable art the couple inherited by covering elements of paintings he considered inappropriate with black paint. Those two things are not the same. Also, that art thing is a really great way to depreciate your net worth. Escape and scandal. Armand was as unpleasant and possessive as Hortense was sweet and spirited. He was deeply jealous, often waking her at midnight to search her room for hidden lovers. He forced her to leave Paris and her life and friends there and come with him to the country, where he expected her to spend six hours in prayer every day. Hortense sought solace in a new friendship with Sidney de Courrier. She found solace in a new friendship with Sidney de Corset. There we go. Although Hortense's memoirs claim quite piously they were just close friends, historians are quite happy to read between the lines of that one to a romantic relationship. 
Whilst obviously it's important to believe women who even in 2024 we far too often don't believe about their relationships and sex life, we have to know that the context of Hortense's memoirs being written with the aim of convincing the court that she be, should be allowed to divorce her husband, so it's fair to suggest that she might leave out parts that might make them look less favourably upon her plight. Armand was furious when he found out and locked both women in a convent. However, it seems that they had great fun playing practical jokes on the nuns and enjoying each other's company. And you know, spiking the holy water with ink, pouring water on the nuns' beds, escaping onto the roof through the chimney. Oof. The nuns begged Armand to take his teenage wife back. Neither of them were unhappy about it. Hortense did not idly take the abuse, though. It was around that time that she started writing her memoirs, which was highly unusual for women in the 17th century. Her main reason was to chronicle her husband's behaviour, to have a solid case against him in court. They made it another seven years and four children together, during which time Armand's attempts to control her included taking everything she owned and instructing the servants to capture her whenever she tried to flee. Eventually, King Louis was forced to intervene in an attempt to help them coexist peacefully. But on the night of the 13th of June, 1668, Hortense had finally had enough and made a big bid for escape. She fled in the night, dressed in men's clothing and left her children behind. It was a move so unusual that it attracted a lot of attention, both from the court and the public, even spawning magazines devoted to the topic. Hortense spent much time on the road, often traveling in men's clothing, sometimes joined by her sister Marie, who was now a princess and fleeing her own husband. She spent time in several different European countries, evading her husband's attempts to force her to return. The exiled courtier Bassi Rabutin noted for his running observations on the scrapes and scandals of the French court, wrote that no cuckold has ever been so deserving of the title as the Duke Mazarin, and every day of his life gives me more admiration for his wife, who prefers to take to the road rather than suffer his presence any longer. Eventually, Louis XIV was forced to intervene again. He ordered Armand to refrain from slandering Hortense and offered himself as her protector, along with her former suitor, the Duke of Savoy. Graciously, she accepted the annual pension of 24,000 livres, except offered by the king, and moved to the household of the Duke. She established her home there as a meeting place for authors, philosophers, and artists. But um, the Duke died not long after, and unfortunately, his wife kicked Hortense out because she'd been sleeping with the Duke, so. Once more she was alone. Her husband had managed to freeze all of her bank accounts, including her pension from the King, which left her penniless, and as she returned to him, but that was out of the question. Finances and feminism. Hortense is sometimes called a proto-feminist. Her desire to divorce her husband and live independently are struggles aligned with the feminist movement. However, both Hortense and her sister Marie's memoirs make a case for their freedom not based on the idea that all women should have such rights, but that their particular plight should be considered. Their memoirs are full of the correct titles for everyone they met and interacted with to demonstrate their many well-respected connections. However, Hortense's adventures did force her to grapple with how dependent her position was on money. In her memoirs, she notes that, it is true that I never dreamed that I would lack money, but experience has taught me that it is the first thing that one runs out of, especially people like me who have never been short of it, and in consequence, who have never understood its importance and the need to manage it. Patricia Trelakian, an internationally recognized scholar of Renaissance and 17th century French female writers, and gender, says that Hortense's memoirs tell the story of a woman's financial education. When she ran away from her husband, she had to transform from a young woman who had grown up in a society that told her that money wasn't her concern, she didn't have to worry about it, into a woman who could support herself. Linda Porter, author of Mistresses, Sex and Scandal at the Court of Charles II, stresses that it would be incorrect to describe Hortense as empowered or to view her actions through a modern feminist lens. However, Hortense certainly used the tools at her disposal effectively. In the opening of her memoir, she writes, if the events that I have recounted to you seem like something out of a novel, blame it on my unhappy fate rather than my inclination. I know that a woman's glory lies in not giving rise to gossip, and those who know me well enough know that I do not care for making a public sensation. There is a certain irony in a woman who secured her freedom through making a name for herself, claiming that she is uninterested in gossip or public sensation. Hortense's life in her memoir contained a lot of both. 
but this might suggest that Hortense knew what she was doing and perhaps had more agency than we often think women in history did when we look back at them from the lofty heights of the 21st century feminism. Charles I and his daughter. After the Duke of Savoy's death, Hortense had no source of income as her husband had frozen all of her accounts and prevented her from accessing either her inheritance from the Cardinal or her pension from Louis XIV. I mean, dealing with banks can be hard enough in the 21st century. Try dealing it when it's literal gold and they know your stinking awful ex personally. Enter Ralph Montague, the English ambassador to France. Now he knew about Hortense's plight and hoped that she could help him with his plight, increasing his standing and influence with his own king, Charles II. And not a plight really there, Ralph. I told you Charles would come up again. Montague hoped that Hortense would be able to replace Charles's current mistress and out of other options, Hortense agreed to try, pretending to only be visiting her niece, Mary of Medina, who had just married Charles II's younger brother, James, the Duke of York. Hortense travelled to England. And yes, she dressed as a man for her journey. Although appearing as a man whilst travelling was generally thought to be safer, it's actually believed by historians that Hortense's penchant for cross-dressing was actually more of an outward expression of her gender neutrality. Hortense arrived in England shortly after her memoirs had actually been translated into English, so there was quite a buzz about her arrival. By mid-1676, she had secured the position of the king's favourite, and he provided her with a £4,000 a year pension, so that gave her quite a clear amount of financial security. It was the perfect match. They both loved lavish parties, riding and fencing. The king didn't even mind her numerous affairs. The playwright Afra Bang even dedicated the introduction to one of her novellas to Hortense, turning it into a full-blown love poem. However, it wasn't long before Hortense displayed that she'd most certainly earned the reputation that had preceded her to England. <coughs> She had an affair with Charles's illegitimate daughter, Anne, Countess of Sussex. If you've heard of another historical Anne who was famously gay, you might be thinking of Anne Lister. I've made a video about her too. You can click the card up in the top right hand corner to watch it or find the link in the video description. Anne was both married and pregnant when she met Hortense and about half of Hortense's age, but that didn't stop them from forming a relationship. And although we don't know the exact details, we do know that their affair culminated in being caught in the middle of a friendly public fencing match in St James's Park, both in their nightgowns and cheered on by a crowd of admiring men. So dramatic, so scandalous. A perfect theme for a restoration era lesbian romance, I ever heard one. Immediately, Anne was sent to an estate in the country where she reportedly refused to leave her bed and just lay there kissing a small painting of her beloved Hortense. Sounds about queer. Charles was more annoyed, however, by Hortense's affair with Louis, the Prince of Monaco. Going after my daughter is one thing, but messing with my geopolitics is just another. He sulked and took away her pension for a few days until she just gave up being his mistress, so he started paying her again. If only all jobs had an exit package that good. The King and Hortense actually remained on really good terms for the rest of his life, and then following the death of Charles II, Hortense was well provided for by James II, probably to be fair because she was the aunt of his wife. But of course, Hortense's husband wasn't exactly thrilled with any of these events. Oh yes, Armand was still knocking around. I know, we were all hoping he'd met a tragic end. And in 1689, he came back demanding his wife to return home with him or at least be forced into a convent, like that had worked so well the first time. This court case was one of the earliest to be reported on, with news printed and distributed via pamphlet. As Hortense had planned, the lawyers used her memoir and letters as testimony. Although Armand technically won the legal case, Hortense had just run up considerable debts in England, including by hiring overly expensive lawyers, and the English court decreed that she actually couldn't leave the country until she'd paid them. Oh no! What a shame. Writing about the 2007 translation of Hortense's memoirs by Sarah Nelson for the London Review of Books, Elizabeth Landonson explained that Armand argued that he should not be held responsible for his wife's debts since he had not authorised her expenditures. Hmm. So Hortense simply stayed in England. Checkmate! 
Even when King James and his wife, her niece, Queen Mary, were forced to flee to France and James's daughter and her husband, William and Mary, were crowned joint rulers, what has just managed to remain in place somehow, although the pension she received from them was much smaller. One reading of this is that she didn't really care about politics and was kind of apolitical, but it's important to acknowledge that she was making these choices within the limited options available to her if she wanted to secure her safety and position in England and not be forced to return back to her stupid husband. Also, maybe she was just really good with people. And it's hard to argue that she was too frivolous to care about serious topics like politics, as during her time in England she created a space where women could have an interest in and an opinion about politics and other intellectual topics. A salon and sphere of influence. While historians have often focused on the more sexy and scandalous parts of Hortense's life, her pension allowed her to set up a salon in London next to St James's Park. A salon, by the way, is a gathering of people held by the host with the specific purpose of entertaining or educating the guests. It's the perfect place to share knowledge, ideas and broaden your mind. This was a time when women could not attend university and weren't encouraged to engage in intellectual discussions. So Hortense's salon became a place where women were free to explore their interests in culture, arts and sciences. Salons like this were common in France, but Hortense's salon was the first in England and soon became the most celebrated in Europe. At Hortense's salon, aristocratic women could gamble alongside men as well as discussing the political, diplomatic and philosophical debates of the day. Now, normally women would be excluded from these conversations as they weren't able to attend the coffee houses or academies where men held such discussions. But here was Hortense creating a space where women were equal to men, just as entitled to share their ideas on art and literature and science. Charles II attended Hortense's salon before his death, added several of the other royal mistresses. It's easy to kind of paint the women vying for the king's attention as rivals, but they were happy to socialise together independently of the king. Hortense invited writers and scientists and courtiers to engage in conversation, to watch operas and to plays and to listen to scientists and theologians. She exchanged letters for scientists who hoped to have their work accepted by the royal societies and acted as networkers and mediators, introducing everyone to everyone else and sending feedback for each of them. Hortense can also claim some credit for introducing champagne to the UK and popularising it amongst aristocratic society. She was very much an influencer of the restoration period and people paid attention to her actions. When her salon started reading certain scientific texts, there would suddenly be a rush of demand for each paper. Afra Byrne, a playwright, poet, translator, and one of the first women in England to make a living from her writing, dedicated her novel, The History of the Nun, to Hortense. And the language of that dedication certainly suggests a romantic relationship between her and Hortense. To the most illustrious princess, the Duchess of Mazarin, how infinitely one of your own sex adored you, and that among all the numerous conquests your grace has made of the hearts of men, your grace has not subdued a more entire slave. Again, we can't know for sure what kind of relationship the two women had, but that definitely sounds pretty gay. Right. Although she was accruing debts, it feels like Hortense was very much in her element during this period of her life. Dr. Annalise Nicholson believes that the independence Hortense had gained, as well as her sexual exploits and the habit of donning men's clothing, led to her contributions to the culture of Restoration London being largely ignored. She created an amazing, spectacular space where men and women could freely converse and share knowledge. She spread the word of scientific discoveries and ideas. She was the hostess of a vital cultural institution. As many aspects of Hortense's story do, it really highlights that even when a woman has built a position of influence and even power, that influence and her importance is often dismissed by those looking back at her life. Death and legacy. After Hortense's death in 1699, her husband caught up with her in England. It is much easier to do that when someone is dead. Armand paid off Hortense's debts and then, being the utter creep that he was, decided to travel around with her in a coffin for four months as he took on a tour of all the many places she had resented him for forcing her to accompany him to early in their marriage. Yeah, cool. Once again, he only stopped when the king intervened and he was forced to bury her. But at least everyone knew for sure after that who the weird one was in that relationship. 
Hortense's story illustrates how little power and agency women have been afforded through much of history, treated as property to be exchanged in marriage contracts with no protection from their husband's whims and wishes. Yet, despite the constraints placed on her, Hortense defied social conventions and made a name for herself. She leveraged her aristocratic birth and 17th century celebrity status to cling on to her freedom and claim the right to make her own choices. As diarist John Writing wrote about Hortense's death, she's written her own story and adventure. And four of her five great granddaughters went on to become mistresses of King Louis XV. I feel like she would have greatly approved. And fun fact, all of the sovereign princes of Monaco, from Prince Honor V, including the current ruler, Prince Albert II, are descended from her. I hope you've enjoyed this romp through Restoration Era Europe. Uh, I hope if you're in the mood for more historical adventures, remember to check out my playlist of other historical profiles here by clicking the card up here or the link down in the description below. I would love to hear if you have any recommendations for other gay or disabled feminist figures I should cover in future videos. Please leave a comment and let me know. And you can find me being gay and disabled over on Instagram at Jessica Out of the Closet. Thank you so much for watching and I will see you in my next video. Bye bye.